Welcome to Clinical Practice New Employee Orientation for Infection Prevention and Control. Some of the objectives of this slide performance is we will identify the importance of hand hygiene, identify clinically significant organisms and how we should be isolating them and how we deal with them in the clinical practice setting, review bloodborne pathogens and standard precautions, and describe the proper use of multi-dose vials. Hand hygiene has consistently shown to be the best way to prevent healthcare-associated infections, whether in the hospital or in the clinical practice setting. We have two methods of hand hygiene, alcohol-based hand sanitizer and soap and water. And we want to avoid products brought from home, especially lotions and soaps from alternative places like Bed Bath & Beyond and the such, because they might not be compatible with our healthcare hand sanitizers and soaps. So the basics of hand hygiene. The easy way to remember this is hand hygiene before patient contact and hand hygiene after patient contact. And also hand hygiene before performing a procedure, before giving a patient food or handing them something, and when you move from a contaminated body site to a clean body site. And then subsequently, anytime you touch something dirty or after patient contact, you wanna do hand hygiene as well. This is the five moments of hand hygiene as displayed by the WHO. And as we discussed before touching a patient, before a procedure, after a procedure, and after touching a patient, and then when you leave the patient's surroundings. These are the easy things to remember. So when we do hand hygiene, we have to remember that our hands are three-dimensional. We have areas that are consistently missed. Some of those areas are the thumb and the fingers, and then in between our fingers as well and many of us are wearing rings or have jewelry and be cognizant of the fact that those are areas frequently missed. And when it comes to jewelry and things like that, <laughs> nails, uh, artificial nails are considered a no-no in healthcare because nails that are greater than a quarter of an inch long can harbor bacteria underneath their nails. And then also no acrylic, shellac, tips, wraps, stickers, etc., and only non-chipped regular nail polish is allowed. Bacteria can actually invade the nail bed and live underneath an artificial nail bed or an abnormally long nail bed and can cause outbreaks. So this is the chain of infection, and a break in any of the link of the chain of infection can potentially avoid a disease. So let's use influenza or flu as the infectious agent. Influenza or flu can live in humans, but they can also live in animals. So if you can remove the reservoir, the sick human or sick animals, then we could potentially prevent the infection. And we also have a portal of entry and portal of exit. If a patient is symptomatic and sneezing and coughing, we can give them a surgical mask and that can help reduce the portal of exit. Portal of entry is washing our hands to make sure we don't get the disease in the first place. And then the susceptible host. Many times people visiting healthcare institutions are susceptible hosts because they're already sick. So now we're gonna move into the different types of precautions that we use in the healthcare setting. Some of these are more applicable to the hospital, but there are also clinical practice um, uses as well. So when it comes to standard or universal precautions, we must discuss this before any other. So we must consider any patient and all blood or body fluids as potentially infectious. So if a patient is in the waiting room and they're coughing or sneezing, you don't need to know if they have the flu or if they're sick, you can offer them a mask. You should offer them Kleenex, tissues, and hand hygiene as well. If a patient's in the waiting room and they have a cut and they're bleeding, offer them a Band-Aid or gauze, but you wanna treat them as potentially infectious, so you would like to wear gloves and always protect yourself against any blood or body fluid regardless of isolation because we never know what the patient may or may not have. So now we're gonna move into the different ways of transmitting disease. One of these ways is through contact precautions and direct transmission from a person to person or indirect transmission through an inanimate object such as a fomite. A fomite could be the remote control of your TV or it could be the mouse on your computer and any time a contaminated hand would touch any of those items, you have the potential to transmit disease to someone else by touching that same contaminated item. Some of the organisms that are transmitted by contact precautions 
are MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, VRE, vancomycin-resistant Enterococcus, other multidrug-resistant organisms, lice, and Clostridium difficile, or C. diff. C. diff is highlighted in orange because we would like you to wash your hands with soap and water, specifically after contact with a patient having C. diff or diarrhea. Many times you'll not know if the patient has C. diff, but a good rule of thumb in healthcare is if a patient's having diarrhea, you should wash your hands with soap and water. This is because the soap and water will detach the organism from your hands and allow it to run down the sink. In the hospital setting, we use gowns and gloves to prevent diseases spread by contact precautions. However, in the clinical practice setting, we don't need to wear gowns and gloves because by using exceptional hand hygiene and by cleaning using low-level disinfectant, we can reduce the risk for the next patient. Many of our hospitalized patients are chronically sick and we're constantly in their environment, so the gowns and gloves are used there. However, in the outpatient setting, we can simply wash our hands and clean contaminated equipment. The key is to disinfect both our hands with alcohol-based hand sanitizer or soap and water and equipment to prevent the spread of disease. Transmission of infections by organisms using the droplet precautions. Droplet precautions organisms are spread by coughing, sneezing, talking, etc. So some organisms spread by droplet are influenza and all the respiratory viruses, including respiratory syncytial virus, meningococcal meningitis, pertussis whooping cough, and for droplet precautions, we have the photo of the healthcare worker wearing a surgical mask. Patients and staff can wear a surgical mask. This can help reduce the risk of infection. Droplet precautions organisms have very heavy wet secretions and they do not travel far and the surgical mask can catch any of these secretions. And if the patient's in the waiting room and is coughing or sneezing or symptomatic, offer them a surgical mask if they can tolerate it. And lastly, we move into airborne precautions and these are organisms spread by very small airborne droplets through the air. And for this, you would want to wear an N95 fit-tested respirator as seen on the slide. Some organisms are TB, tuberculosis, measles, varicella, including chickenpox and shingles. And it's important to note that in the clinical practice setting, we are not equipped to handle these patients from an isolation standpoint. If you have any questions, call infection prevention at your closest institution, either Sinai, Northwest, or Cowell, if you suspect a patient with the above diagnosis. So along with cleaning our hands, we need to clean healthcare equipment as well. And the number one way we do that is using our low-level disinfectant. This may or may not be the low-level disinfectant that you use in your clinical setting, but on the bottle of your low-level disinfectant, it will have the contact time. And the contact time is the amount of time needed to um, disinfect the item properly. And all shared patient equipment should be cleaned between patient use. How to disinfect. Make sure you, while wearing gloves, you use your practice's low-level disinfectant. No matter the product, read the label and follow the instructions for cleaning for contact time. The contact time refers to the amount of time the item needs to stay wet in order to achieve low-level disinfection. And now we will move into bloodborne pathogens. We're going to identify the different types of bloodborne pathogens and how to reduce the risk in your clinical practice setting. When we discuss bloodborne pathogens, what we're really discussing are the big three, HIV, AIDS, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C. The biggest takeaway from this slide is your risk of a needle stick, your risk of transmission from a needle stick is 0.3% if the source patient has HIV. And since 1999, there have been no healthcare worker conversions of a healthcare worker to HIV negative to HIV positive from a needle stick. You are much more likely to get hepatitis B or hepatitis C from a needle stick. And hepatitis B, we have a vaccine for, so please avail yourself of that vaccine. In this slide, you can see the amount of viral particles in a drop of blood. On the picture all the way to the left, you have 100 microliters, or a large drop of blood. In that large drop of blood, there are 10 million hepatitis B particles, 100 to 100,000 hepatitis C particles, and only 6 to 700 HIV particles. This would be akin to a large nosebleed, a large drop of blood. We can move all the way to the figure on the right, 
and we have a tenth of a microliter, 0.1 microliters of blood, and you can see the amount of viral particles is significantly less. This is the amount of blood in the tip of a butterfly needle should you get a needle stick, and your risk of HIV is six thousandths to seven hundredths. So very low risk for HIV. However, there are still 10,000 hepatitis B viral particles. When it comes to needles and sharps safety, discard sharps immediately after use. Discard them in the sharps containers or in the bin. Do not overfill the sharps containers and never recap needles. And always use safety devices appropriately. In the event of a needle stick, wash the site with soap and water and let it bleed. You want to avoid a secondary infection. Do not push anything out of the site. Simply wash with soap and water and notify your supervisor. Call your LifeBridge Health Occupational Health Service for further instructions. And for an additional provider support, you may follow up with the CDC at the number provided. And now red bag trash. What goes in red bag trash? Only items that are contaminated with blood or body fluids, which would release these substances in a liquid or semi-liquid state, can go into red bag trash. A tissue with a little bit of blood from a nosebleed does not go in red bag trash. Only items that are soaking, soiled, or dripping with blood or body fluids go into red bag trash. And now needle safety. One needle, one syringe, only one time. We never reuse needles, but we also never reuse syringes. There have been outbreaks associated with the reuse of syringes. Since 2001, there have been at least 49 outbreaks due to the mishandling of injectable medical products. 21 of these outbreaks have involved transmission of hepatitis B or hepatitis C. Multidose vials. After 28 days, all multidose vials are to be discarded due to the fact that they do not contain antimicrobials and bacteria may grow in them. And be sure to use single-use vials only on one patient. Do not use vials marked as single-use on multiple patients. Respiratory etiquette. Be sure to cough or sneeze in your sleeve. We are all healthcare workers and our hands are our instruments. So avoid coughing or sneezing in your hands as these are what we use to take care of patients. Avoid spreading respiratory droplets and always wash your hands. For influenza prevention or flu prevention, we have a vaccine. And the flu virus is a severe respiratory virus that causes cough, fever, headache, etc. And the flu can be fatal as it is still responsible for over 30,000 deaths each year. And the most effective way to prevent the flu is through your annual vaccination, which is given through LifeBridge free of charge. And final thoughts. Practice exceptional hand hygiene to avoid spreading infections and getting yourself sick. Consider all patients' blood or body fluids as potentially infectious. And whenever possible, dedicate single-use vials for single patient use. Never use a vial intended for one patient on multiple patients.